Today's lecture starts with a problem that's an example of uh, a, an issue that's central to essentially all genetics in all different organisms on the planet. In this case, the example that we're using is the expression of hemoglobin in a human being. Now, if you remember, hemoglobin is the uh, material, the, the molecule in the blood carried by the red blood cells that carries oxygen and the hydrogen ion primarily uh, to and from the tissues. And the hemoglobin that you have right now is a large molecule that is made up of four different pieces, four different proteins that are called globin. And we've seen that before. We've talked about the beta globin uh, gene. We, sh we saw that, and we're going to come back to that again today. But the beta globin gene produces one of those proteins. The other one is produced in your body right now mainly by another gene that produces a protein very similar to it called alpha globin. And uh, the hemoglobin itself is made up of those things. I'll show you the details of that here in, in a moment. But that's not true throughout your life. That changes. That when you were developing as an embryo and a fetus, you weren't, uh, your hemoglobin wasn't made out of alpha and beta primarily. It's made out of different things. And this graph is showing that. What you have here on this axis is the percentage of the hemoglobin in an individual's body that's made up of these different chains, alpha, beta, and there are others here which I'm about to talk about. On this axis down here you have time. Now here six weeks after conception, so this is six weeks after the zygote has formed and this is about the embryonic period, then we get into the fetal period coming up through here through six weeks all the way up through the 39th week, which is the time of birth. And then following along here, this follows you all the way up to 42 weeks after birth. So these lines here are showing what happens in the various time periods and what percentage of the hemoglobin is made up of these different chains. Look, look at this blue line uh, curve here. This curve is the alpha curve. So this is what I was saying before. Adult hemoglobin has two alpha chains on it and then two beta chains. The alpha gene, the alpha expression, uh, follows this profile. If you notice, right off the bat, very, very early in, uh, in development, you start to produce hemoglobin. Even before you have a heart, that hemoglobin has about 25% or 23% alpha globin at the time it starts. And then the alpha globin gets ramped up so that over time the percentage goes up to 50% by the time you get to about 10 weeks. And then from that period on, all of the hemoglobin in an individual's body is half alpha. These other ones are interesting. There's this one here that's delta, that, or sorry, zeta, that's the lowercase Greek letter zeta. And then another one here, this is uh, epsilon. And it, it's expressed primarily in this portion of the embryo called the yolk sac. But notice, as the yolk sac disappears, these two globin proteins also disappear. And at the time when they're disappearing, another protein starts to be uh, expressed, and it's this beta. Beta globin is the, the gene that I showed you earlier. And you notice throughout the early period of the fetal develop, developmental stage, you're about uh, 8 or 9% beta globin. But then as you approach the last about uh, nine weeks or so of development, you notice that the fetal hemoglobin starts to go up so that just about two or three weeks after birth, you've got about half of your 25%, uh, which is uh, half of the uh, non-alpha chains, are beta. And then by the time you get to be about uh, 42 weeks, you're at the adult condition where half of the hemoglobin is alpha and half of it is beta. So what's going on here in the uh, fetal stages? Well, the beta is low, but what happens is it's being replaced by this in the fetal stage. And this, if you follow down through here, if you follow it, goes to this type of, of uh, hemoglobin, which is called gamma globin. And it's, it's uh, what we call fetal hemoglobin because fetal hemoglobin is made up of two alpha chains and generally made up of then two gamma chains. So what happens then is the fetal hemoglobin disappears and begins to decrease at about the 30th week. And so then by the time you get to about 18 to 24 weeks, it's down again into the adult condition where it's still there, but it's, it's very, very low, very low percentage of all of the hemoglobin that you have in your body has any delta in, or sorry, gamma in it. There's another one. This one starts at the time of birth and it's delta and it's shown earlier and it comes up earlier and it never gets significant. It stays very low throughout your life, but it's always there. So why do we have all of this? Well, that's evolutionary. Some of these uh, uh, genes are functioning in ways that are not associated strictly with the blood. 
Uh, some of them are vestigial, like Delta could very well be a vestigial gene. So that's something then that needs to get worked out. But what we're interested in is why does this change? When you think about it, your body from the time that you're a zygote, remember, goes through mitosis. Mitosis is clonal division. And clonal division is genetically identical. So all the cells in your body are genetically identical except for the sex cells. So how is it that all of these, or these, these cells in your body are able to express such different proteins throughout time and in different places. Notice early on these genes are expressed in the yolk sac. Then primarily in the early fetal stages all the way through about the time of birth they're expressed primarily in the liver and then later in the spleen and then by the time you're in the adult condition it's all, essentially all in the bone marrow. So why does this change not just in time but also in space? That's what I want to get into. I want to get into the control of these genes. The short story is this. Genes are expressed in different places in different times because genes can turn off and they can turn on. And there's an entire control system in your body that's controlling when these genes actually do that and in what tissues they're expressed in. And honestly, if you want a Nobel Prize, that's a really good place to study because we don't have all the answers. In fact, we don't have really many of the answers into what's going on with the control. Now, I know I have friends who are working in exactly this problem and they're going to disagree with me, but I'm sorry they're wrong. We just don't know a lot of this stuff yet. So there's a whole world of problems out there that you can solve. And if you can solve these problems, there's an enormous amount of good that can come from it because then we can start to target drugs that will cause genes to turn off when they're on at the wrong time and cause genes to turn on when they're off at the wrong time. Okay, so to start with this problem, to understand how it is that the genes are functioning and turning on and turning off in different places at different times, we have to remind ourselves what genes actually do. If you remember, the whole... Uh, issue is associated with proteins. Phenotypes are developed by proteins. Or they're generated by proteins. And so just to remind ourselves of the stuff that we've studied already in the first unit of this uh, course, proteins are sequences of amino acids that are connected by these peptide bonds. Now remember, if you take amino acids and bind them together, you get a polypeptide because another name for amino acid is peptide. So a polypeptide is a polymer, peptides. But remember, if you get long enough, it gets to be about 80 or so amino acids long, then this kind of interesting thing happens. What happens is the protein, sorry, the polypeptide will start to fold, and it folds in a, in a characteristic sort of way. One of the main types of folds that you get are these things, these helical structures that occur in the sequence. So this sequence of DNA right here, the, or sorry, the sequence of amino acids right here, will form into this kind of a helix. Not a double helix, just a standard helix, and we call that an alpha helix. In some cases, the protein will go around and fold back on itself and then bind with hydrogen bonds into kind of a sheet structure like this, but it'll be folded. It'll go out and in and out and in, sort of corrugated like cardboard, and we call that a beta pleated sheet. So proteins will do this in different places, uh, or these polypeptides, when they get long enough, will do this in different places, but then the magic happens. Once you have that those structures formed, then all of that folds up into a blob that looks like this, and we get what we've seen before, the tertiary structure of the protein. Here is the tertiary structure of beta globin. The beta globin is uh, folded into this kind of blob here that has two alpha helices and one beta pleated sheet. That, again, is the tertiary structure of the protein. Where the alpha helices are and where the beta pleated sheets are are the what we call the secondary structures of the protein. So I'm not going to get into a lot of the details on secondary, primary, and tertiary structures. What I'm going to focus on primarily in this class are primary and tertiary. The secondary structures are important, but uh, that's something you'll study when you get upper division courses. Now, that's not all proteins can do. Proteins can take these tertiary structures and bind them together into these larger structures of proteins bound with other proteins. And again, remember the protein is any polypeptide that folds into a tertiary structure. And these proteins together form this big complex right here that we refer to as the quaternary structure. When you have tertiary structures bound together, we call that a quaternary structure of, of a molecule. And really, this thing acts as a single molecule. It doesn't really act as, in this case, four different proteins. Those subunits one through four, there are four different proteins that are bound together here. This acts as a single molecule. And this molecule that's shown right here is in fact this one right here you see there's four of these units this one here this blue one there's another blue one in the back there's a green one in the front here and a green one in the back here 
Those four different proteins in this structure right here are different globins. These two are alpha globin and these two are beta globin. So like I said at the beginning of the lecture, this is adult hemoglobin. There's two alpha units and two beta units that are bound together into this quaternary structure. So the gene that I was talking about makes this structure down here, the beta. So where does this alpha come from? And remember, if we look here, if we look at fetal hemoglobin, fetal hemoglobin is similar. There's four of these globins bound together into what we call a tetramer. There's a two alpha structures here at the top, and then at the bottom here, you've got two gamma structures. So here's the question. Where do these things come from? Where is it that these proteins actually come from? The gene we saw only makes this one, beta globin. So these other ones, the answer is these alpha globins and, and uh, gamma globins and delta and epsilon and zeta are all coming from different genes. So the answer to the question is why it is that our hemoglobin as adults looks like this, two alphas and two betas, and in the fetus it's primarily two alphas and two gammas, is the fact that there are different genes for different globins that turn on and off at different times. That's the key. And if we look at those genes, you've actually seen this cluster already on this chromosome, number 11, when we did the flyover of chromosome 11, we saw where the beta uh, globin gene is, and this is it right here. Now near it are other genes. There's a delta globin, that's the globin that is expressed as, in the adult and always a very, very low level. And then there's two different gammas, there's the A gamma and the G gamma, and then there's an epsilon gene, and then there's this thing called psi beta 1. This cluster of globin genes is essentially copies of the same sequence that have been inserted in different parts of the chromosome. That's a pattern we see a lot. You'll see that genes come in families. There isn't typically one gene for a particular uh, function. There's a gene that may perform a particular function, but then there are various forms of it, copies of it, that have been changed over evolutionary time to perform different functions, and sometimes wildly different functions. It turns out these are primarily all associated with carrying oxygen and doing that kind of thing, but they all have variation, uh, variable differences. Like, for example, these gammas, uh, carry oxygen and deliver it uh, 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 to the tissues differently than the alpha and beta chains do in the adult. Now, it isn't just this cluster of globins. There's another cluster. It's on chromosome 16. On chromosome 16, there's two alphas, there's a zeta, and then there's these two, psi zeta 1 and psi alpha 1. These genes here are pseudogenes. These are false genes. They're essentially genes that have... Uh, probably in the past been functional, been copied, inserted on the chromosomes, and then broken. Over time, something happens to them and they actually become non-functional. They're not expressed, they're never even transcribed, or maybe if they're transcribed, the transcript doesn't produce a, a globin protein. So why are they there? Well, again, evolution explains that. They're there because these are vestigial genes. And in fact, you have lots of them, lots of these vestigial genes scattered throughout your genome, which is another indication of evolution. These things are busted versions of genes that are functional in other organisms. So again, they're vestigial. Now, the point then is this. During development, the alpha, two alpha genes turn on and are expressed essentially constantly. But early on in the fetal stage, it's primarily these gamma genes that are on. And then they turn off starting at about the 30th week. And the beta gene starts to turn on more and more and to, until you get to about 42 weeks after uh, development, after birth and you're into the adult uh, condition. So how does all of this work? It comes down to the central dogma we talked about before. If you remember this, the central dogma says all the information about uh, traits, not all the information, but the, the primary information traits are held in DNA. That DNA gets copied in the messenger RNA, which is then read by ribosomes, which produce these proteins. And then the protein produces the phenotype, the trait. So what we're saying then is that the trait of hemoglobin type varies over time because different parts of the DNA are on or off. And I want to discuss how this whole process works. I want to look at the mechanism of this. And the mechanism actually comes down to this. When we look at this sequence here, this is the primary sequence of the various types of globins, the alpha globin, beta globin, gamma, and delta. And each one of these letters, the V for example, the G, the V is for valine. And that's one of the amino acids. And so if we follow beta, the amino acids then go V, H, L, T, and so forth. Those are all different amino acids, and you can see that this all uh, is laid out uh, in this very easy way. 
Now, I show in one of the other videos for the laboratory what the actual DNA sequence is that, that produces this amino acid sequence. But these proteins, all these proteins, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, you can tell are really similar. Look at this. Every place you look, every single one, they are mainly the same, but they might vary at one or two spots. Like, for example, right here, they're all W. Here, they're all G. Here, they're all K. Here, they're all V. So this is what I say, they're the same protein, but there's slight variations. And these areas that are green are highlighted large differences in those proteins. But you notice most of the other areas in the proteins are very, very similar. So all the proteins are about the same size. They're all about 145 amino acids big. And if you look at the, the simply raw percent similarity in this particular alignment for these uh, alpha and beta chains, they're about 60% the same. So when we say they're the same protein, this is what we mean. They're not identical base, uh, amino acid sequences, but they're similar enough that they fold into very, very similar tertiary structures, which you saw in one of the previous slides. Okay, so how does that come about? How do we get that? Well, it came from this. This sequence of amino acids here came from this sequence of DNA. And this is what we've seen before, if you remember. The green section here is the promoter. That's the section that controls when the gene is on or off. The yellow sections are the exons. Those are the express portions. In this particular gene, there's three exons. The red portions here are introns. Those are the unexpressed portions that are inside the coding region. In this case, there's two of them. And then there's the end of the gene stuff. It goes all the way until you get to this sequence right here. So that's the central dogma. This sequence of DNA makes that protein. All right, so how does it work? Well, here is the concept. Here is the conceptual uh, uh, part of a gene expression. Right there at the beginning of the first exon, right here, ATG, GTG, CAC, is this sequence right here. What that sequence says is make a protein with the primary structure, methionine, valine, histidine, leucine, threonine, and so on. All right, so this is just the beginning of the first exon. Now notice it continues on quite a ways. It continues on here and here and here. What I'm talking about is just the beginning of this section here, and it makes that sequence of amino acids. Here's another one later in the third exon, which is the last exon. This sequence right here means make this sequence of amino acids, valine, valine, alanine, glycine, valine. Now, do you see the pattern? If you look here, how many amino acids do we have here? We have a total of five, right? How many nucleotides do we have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. All right, what about here? Same thing, 5, we have 15. And you can see then, if you look carefully, this GTG, every place where that sequence of GTG is, there's a valine, right? There's GTG here, and there's GTG here. And that makes it always makes valine. So now you can see the pattern. Each set of three nucleotides codes for one amino acid. Now, that is the genetic code. That's how it actually is read. Each one of these three things makes a particular amino acid or specifies a particular amino acid in the primary structure of the protein. So that's a central dogma. It's right there. What we're looking at is a language, language of nucleic acids, which is then translated into a language of protein. The sequence of nucleotides makes a sequence of amino acids. Three nucleotides acts like a word in the language. And each one of those three nucleotides, sets of cassettes of three nucleotides, we call not word, but codon. So these are codons. There's the, code, the first codon, second codon, third codon, so on. And notice the first, second, and fifth codons in this sequence code for the same amino acid. Therefore, they're the same word, valine, valine, valine. So that's the pattern. That's our basic pattern. And how this pattern actually is used to produce the protein is what I want to attack next. So what the cell actually has to do is take that information in the DNA here and then copy it into RNA. Now this happens in the nucleus. The RNA is then released from the DNA and it goes outside the nucleus. Once it gets outside the nucleus, then it'll, it'll go through the next process. But this process here, simply making the copy of the messenger RNA is what we call transcription. The word transcription, as you probably know, means to just simply write something down letter by letter. Once this messenger RNA moves out of the nucleus then, it can bind to a ribosome, or actually the ribosomes bind to it, and then it can start to read that sequence of nucleotides, and it uses that information to build this structure here, which is a protein. If this is a protein, then what are each of these different circles, the brown circles right here? Each one of those brown circles represents, of course, an amino acid.
So that's how this process works. Now this is the point where the ribosome is taking information that is written down in the language of nucleic acids, nucleotides, and putting it into the language of proteins, where the words are amino acids. So we have a word for that, a word for rendering meaning in one language into another language, and that word is, is translation, of course. So that's why we call this process translation. So making the messenger RNA copy is transcription. Making the protein using that messenger RNA is translation. And there's one last step to this. What we have to do is bring the amino acids, the proper amino acids, in at the right time to this ribosome so it can uh, actually uh, uh, do the translation step itself. The objects that do that are these transfer RNAs. Here we have transfer RNAs carrying amino acids. They're being brought into the ribosome. The ribosome is then taking the amino acid off, putting it into the growing chain, and releasing it as these uncharged, they no longer have an amino acid, transfer RNAs.